The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your family, and your father's house. For the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name so famous that will be used, that it will be used as a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who slight you. All the tribes of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say this song together. May your love be upon us, O Lord, and we pray so our good communion. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone. There, in their presence, he was transfigured. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. They were talking with him. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Lord, he said, it is wonderful for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when suddenly a bright cloud covered them with shadow. And from the cloud there came a voice which said, This is my son, the beloved. He enjoys my favor. Listen to him. When they heard this, the disciples fell on their faces, overcome with fear. But Jesus came up and touched them. Stand up, he said, do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one but only Jesus. 
As they came down from the mountain, Jesus gave them this order. Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Last week, in the first Sunday of Lent, the Gospel reading took us to the desert with Jesus, where Jesus had a battle with the devil, with Satan. And I said, I brought the example of the first big war in the Civil War of America, the Bull Run where the spectators who were certain that they would win that war went hundreds and hundreds and thousands to see how the other part of the civil war would be defeated. And they were caught up in the middle of the battle and they were not victors and they were shot dead because even though they were civilian, they caught them by surprise. And we went to Jesus to the desert. And I said, like these spectators of the bull run, we are caught up in a battle. Like it or not, we are thrown to the battle and we have to fight. Life is a battle. But it's a battle against the devil. It's a battle against Satan. The victory is ours, but we have to fight that battle. And today the gospel reading takes us with Jesus to the mountain. Not the desert, but the mountain. Not the battle, but the contemplation of the glory of God. And life as a disciple, as a missionary disciple of Jesus, is like this, with ups and downs, time of desert and battle, and time of contemplation of the glory of God. All of us has ups and downs. All of us have battle to fight, a moment of glory to contemplate. And why did Jesus allow his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, to see his glory. Because he knew that time of battle will come again. The greatest of all the battles that Jesus had to fight, the battle of the cross. And in this time of the cross, it was so important that the disciples could contemplate the glory of God, the glory of Jesus. But it was important for Jesus to contemplate his glory that he will achieve after the cross, to listen to the Father. And these are moments of strength, this moment of contemplation where we listen to the word of God and we contemplate the glory of God. These are the times of glory that give us strength when the battle comes. Today, we will contemplate the glory of God through the life of a teenager. And that's the teenager. Carlo Acutis, Charlie. Carlo was born in London, accidentally, in 1991. I said accidentally because at that time his mom and dad were in London working and he was both, uh, born in London from an Italian family. And he died in Italy, in Monza, in September 2006, only 15 years old. He died at the age of 15, 
and he died of leukemia. His heroic virtues were approved in July 2018, and he was presented as a model of disciple with the title of Venerable, considering him as a public example to follow. A few days ago, on Friday the 21st of February 2020, Pope Francis approved his first miracle, paving the way of his soon beatification. Now he is a blessed. And he can be publicly worshipped. Another miracle needs to happen, to occur, for him to be declared a saint. And you know what? Miracles do happen every single day. Why don't you ask? Why don't we ask Carlo Acuti for his next miracle? It may happen to you, it may happen to me, it may happen to anyone who is in a bed in hospital. The first miracle happened when a family prayed for his teenage boy suffering the same disease than Carlo, leukemia. And this young boy, the same age, 15, was miraculously healed, cured, before, hours before he was expected to die. Carlo needs another miracle to go to the altar as a saint. His first miracle was approved a few days ago by Pope Francis. We can pray through the intercession of Carlo. If we know somebody is in terrible need of a miracle. But all of us can follow the example of Carlo. Carlo was a teenager. This is the saint to be a normal teenager that we can find in the streets. But he practiced the Christian values and virtues in an extraordinary way. He said, I am happy to die because I lived my life without wasting even a minute of it on anything unpleasant to God. He had a strong devotion of the Blessed Sacrament to the point that he said, my highway to heaven is the Blessed Sacrament, is the Eucharist, is the body of Christ consecrated here and that you are going to receive today. The Eucharist, the body of Christ, the Blessed Sacrament is my highway to heaven. He was very, very devout of the Virgin Mary. And he pilgrimed to Fatima, as we usually do every year, so many times. He had his wonderful, he enjoyed life to the full. He has his holidays, his friends. He spent wonderful time. And he was a computer genius. He designed website professionally at the age of 15 to reach out everyone, fostering, promoting devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and the Virgin Mary. And that you can see with his friends playing games. But I'm sure that that games is how to reach out the many with the devotion of the Virgin Mary and devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Our aim, he said, I have to read from my papers because our aim has to be the infinite and not the finite. 
The infinite is our homeland. We have always, we have always been expected in heaven. His purpose, his goal was always going to heaven, where he belonged, where all of us belong. And this was his tomb before the first miracle. And this is his tomb now, in Assisi, as a venerable, where people fled there to pray to this teenager who died in 2006 and lived a Christian life in an heroic manner. He made a lot of websites, and you will watch now one of his production, all of them, to explain to his young people and teenager the love of the Blessed Sacrament and the love of the Virgin Mary and the miracles of the Eucharist. Now, as I put this banner here, all over the world are these banners, showing the young people how to live lives to the full, how to please God and be happy even in difficult times. He knew that he would die soon. He suffered from leukemia. He knew that he didn't have enough time to live. And he took advantage of every second to reach out the many with the devotion of the Blessed Sacrament and the Virgin Mary. We'll pray today to Carlos Acuti for all the young people of our community, for all the sick in our community, for those who are hopeless, for those who have no purpose and meaning in his life. And now we are going to just only a few minutes to see one of his production, what he used to spread the good news through website. What we are going to watch now, it's something made by Carlos. In the old times, Saint wrote books to spread the good news. Carlo, at the age of 15, only a few years ago, this is what he did to spread the love of God. Sainthood is not reserved for elderly priests, popes, or mystics. It's also possible for 21st century teens like Carlo Acutis. This young Italian died of leukemia in 2006. He lived a short life, but left an impact. When he died, the funeral was full of poor people. Everyone wondered what they were doing there. It was because Carlo had secretly been helping them. The family knew because as he was only 15, his mother was going with him. He brought them sleeping bags or food, and that's why they felt they needed to attend the funeral. Despite the growing pains, Carlo Acutis had an enviable reaction to them. The postulator for his cause explains the key was encountering the one person, Christ. Non è nato santo, se l'è conquistato. La castità per lui è stata Carlo wasn't born a saint, but he worked hard at it. Chastity for him was a result of friendship with Christ. He understood, and that's what he told whoever met him, that to be faithful friends of Christ, one must meet certain demands. Naturally, this was difficult for him. It was difficult, but he passed the test with flexibility. His family and friends highlight his simplicity and capacity to pray in a not-so-Christian environment. Io credo che sia uno delle poche persone I think he was one of the few people capable of pushing his relatives and friends. In other words, his story is not one of a deeply Christian family in terms of practice. His family was normal. Yes, they went to Mass, but when they didn't, it was not a problem. 
Something else they highlight of Carlo was his passion for computers and the internet. In fact, he has become an example of a young person who is capable of making new technologies an instrument to talk about God. Carlo designed web pages dedicated to Eucharistic devotion in the Virgin Mary. Now, Pope Francis has declared him venerable, meaning he considers him as a public example to follow. Hi Carlo, we were hoping we'd run into you today. We want to ask you something. Nice to see you. So tell me, what's on your mind? Uh, well, we usually find it difficult not to get distracted when we're at Mass. But yesterday, when we were with you, we really tried to concentrate. Excellent. You'll see, if you make an effort, you won't get distracted so easily. We wanted to ask you about the consecration. We noticed how you knelt down respectfully. You seemed spellbound by the words of the priest. I can't seem to feel anything at all. Me neither. I find it hard to believe that the consecrated host is the body of Christ. I mean, is it really true? Of course it's true. Jesus really is there in the Eucharist. But how can that be? Doesn't it make more sense to see the consecrated host as something that just represents the body of Christ? You know, like a symbol. How can it really be his body? We can't see anything. The consecrated host isn't just a symbol representing the body of Christ. The consecrated host is the body of Christ. During the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body. Then he took the chalice of wine and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is my blood. But couldn't we just interpret these words symbolically? No, absolutely not. Jesus knew that those listening to him were simple folk, and that even some of his own disciples took everything he said literally. If he had only wanted the words of the Eucharist to be understood in a symbolic way, he would have said so clearly. For example, when he told a parable, he finished by saying, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. He wouldn't have allowed such an important thing to be misunderstood, especially as the hour of the crucifixion was now so close. Sorry, Carlo, does Jesus only mention the Eucharist during the Last Supper? No. In the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the Eucharistic promise is solemnly mentioned. Indeed, before this promise, Jesus prepares his disciples by walking on the water of the Sea of Galilee, and then by multiplying the bread and fish. He suspends the laws of nature. In this way, he shows how he has power over nature, so people will understand that just as he multiplies bread and walks on water, he can transform bread and wine into his own body and blood. But how does Jesus promise the Eucharist exactly? When he talked to the Jews after performing these two miracles, Jesus says that the bread that he will give is his flesh for the life of the world. I am the living bread that came down from heaven and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews started arguing amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. But how can we be sure that his words weren't just a figure of speech? They weren't a figure of speech. Indeed, Jesus underlined, I am the bread of life. That is the central claim, the supreme statement, the truth that Jesus wanted to reveal to the crowd through the miracle of the multiplication of loaves. Jesus states, Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. So, if you hunger for something more than bread, if you have an inexpressible thirst within you, don't limit your expectations of Jesus to food which can perish. The purpose of our life is Him, just Him. We must seek Him, not the bread of the miracle. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor His disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? 
Jesus answered them, saying, Amen. Amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and your stomachs are full. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, and which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. This is the work of God. Believe in what God the Father has sent for you. So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Amen. I tell you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the bread from heaven, the true bread. You should know that the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and those who believe in me will never thirst. And although you all have seen me, yet you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. O oh Lord, give us always this bread. Then the Jews started whispering about him because he'd said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus, totally unperturbed by this, went to the apostles and asked them if they wanted to leave. In this way, they understood that he would prefer to be abandoned by them rather than to retract or change what he had just taught them. Jesus' actions are very eloquent because, seeing that the Jews were troubled by his words, he doesn't say, you misunderstood me, I meant it in a purely symbolic sense. On the contrary, he confirms what he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And this shocked many of the disciples into abandoning him. So how should Jesus' words during the Last Supper be interpreted? Like this. This reality that I hold in my hands, which was bread before, is now my body. And this chalice that I hold in my hands, which contained wine before, now contains my blood. So the bread and wine are no longer there. The bread and wine are no longer there, because in their place is the body and blood of Christ. Right then, going back to the question you asked at the start, I've explained why I pay such close attention at Mass. So now you know my secret. What? Eh? Your secret? Exactly. My secret is having daily contact with Christ. Jesus loves everyone. Everyone was created and wanted by God. Everyone has the potential to be a saint. But God also created everyone free. Free to choose between good and evil. It's up to us to choose to be good. And the Eucharist is an enormous help in orienting us towards the will of God. I particularly try to follow the example of the Apostle John, the beloved disciple. We must all become Jesus' beloved disciples, just like him.